Okay, you all good? Let's do it. Hello and welcome to the B2C Lead Generation Podcast. Welcome back to the B2C Lead Gen Podcast. My name is Daniel Hopewell, here with co-host Simon Delaney, and this is episode 31, There is a Smarter Way to Generate Customers. And the third voice you'll be hearing today as we try and navigate the idea is the commercial head of MVF Global, Josh Joyner, who is now joining us via Zoom. Welcome to the show, Josh. How are you doing today, mate? Afternoon, chats. Very good. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on. That's all right. Are you going to give us a little tinkle on that piano behind you? Uh... I wish. Um, <laughs> it's definitely not mine. Um, and even if I could, I probably wouldn't risk it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm disappointed. I was kind of, it's the first time I've seen musical instruments, the first time I've had it. Yeah, a musical interlude opportunity on this show. All right, we'll have to we'll have to get someone else in next time who can you guys, play us. Guys need to, yeah, maybe I could be your uh, theme tune at some point. <laughs> yeah, we do need to do theme tune. I just I sort of yeah, we uh, got that from like an audio library and something. Yeah, something more custom, I think. Yeah. Um. So to kick us off, Josh, as I always ask people, could you explain to people listening what your role is at MBF? Yeah, I thought I'd maybe start with just giving you a quick intro to MBF. You know, hopefully yeah. people who are listening to this podcast maybe know who we are already, but um, I figure it might be a good place to start. Um, we're, we're a global lead generator, probably close to the biggest, if not one of the biggest worldwide. Um, our reach is, is pretty impressive, 500 plus staff across uh, our two offices, headquarters in London um, and a sort of sales office in Austin, Texas. Been running for like 12 years now. Um, and you know, everything we do is, you know, pivoted towards transforming the way that customers, uh, sorry, the businesses find new customers um, and doing that with a real growth mindset and always thinking about, you know, max scale, um, which is very um, relevant for B2C lead generation in particular, uh, operating and generating leads in 40 countries, 100 plus verticals, um, 30 marketing channels live at any one time. Uh, and last time I checked, just over 4 million lead generated per annum. Um, you know, what we do is it's everything's underpinned by data, but our people are really important. Um, so one of the Sunday Times best uh, companies to work for last year, which is, you know, really great achievement. I think we've been in the top three for, for um, several, probably much the whole time I've been at MVF, which is coming up to six years. Um, so that's a big part of what we do, you know, bringing on really bright grads and, and sort of training them, developing them to, you know, digital marketing leaders. Um, in terms of what I do, um, as I said, I've been at MVF for six years to the end of this year, um, held a range of roles, started out in the sales team, uh, and now sort of responsible for the trading performance of our um, sort of senior healthcare hub, which covers uh, healthcare products as well as uh, sort of end of life and consumer finance, um, which sits within our B2C division. And broadly that's um, assessing the commercial and marketing strategy um, for the team and helping them execute it, which you know, everything from working with clients to develop our partnerships and relationships with them, launching new verticals, um, testing new funnels, and basically just developing and coaching the team so that we can develop future leaders for MBF. Hopefully that gives you a brief overview. Cool. Do you, just before we dig into it, do you mind me asking how or does lead generation vary in each of the countries that you operate? Like, are there any sort of nuances that you find odd or is it all very similar? Uh, massively, I think, um, and I, I'll, I'll touch on that probably throughout this podcast, is a big challenge with being so global is the nuances of each market. You know, US, uh, which actually isn't under my remit, is clearly a much more developed market. Um, UK is probably close behind that. But a lot of the other areas that we navigate, lead generation is nowhere near as prevalent. There's not the same level of ecosystem for software to manage it or companies to supply it. So um, you know, ranging from all across Europe, you know, we operate in Japan, in um, Indonesia, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, very different marketing landscape to, to where we are, you know, in Europe and, and in the UK, where I know you guys um, are predominantly, predominantly based. Um, in terms of differences, we do see a lot of similar similarities in campaigns we run, but obviously we lean heavily on translation agencies and our clients to help us navigate the sort of nuances that each of them have, you know, in the verticals we run, a lot of them um, might have like gov government subsidies, you know, so understanding 
how that affects people's buying behavior is really, really important. And actually, you know, having the team um, to research those verticals and to have a really deep understanding of, you know, the different buying behaviors is really key. Yeah. So um, the part of the title of this part is talking about ultimately generating customers as the end point, but why do you think um, brands need to think about leads as being the key to sales eventually? Um, I, I think when you when you work in the industry, you realise that it's not just the sort of the verticals that you touch and the, the clients that you work with, but lead generation is practically everywhere. You know, it's like all businesses do lead generation in some form. They might not know it, but they're doing it. Um, otherwise, they're not going to grow. Um, but the companies that understand that you know their customers are all online now, you know, no matter what industry you're in, there's, there's some element of um, online activity um, and get organized around that. So they run their own campaigns, um, do their own lead generation, whether that's directing traffic to their own website or working with third parties like MBF or, or many of our competitors. It's, it's about having like a comprehensive strategy that allows you to get people at all stages in the funnel. You know, someone who's, um, research deeply research and diligently research understands a, a product they want to buy you know maybe they will interact with your brand at that level but there's a load of people who are very early on in their buying process and uh, a third party or a white label lead generator is the perfect person to sit there and give customers what they want which is ultimately you know the best deal they can get and a comparison of, of what opportunities are out there and that's really why I think our model is so successful um, because it's quite a hard thing to do um, and if you if you've got the right systems and processes it can be like I think the number one way to scale any sales-led organization um, but that's the key thing is like how do you take the leads and turn them into sales it's not enough to just be generating lists of data. Mm. And do you focus on um like leads with telephone numbers so direct contact or do you do more email stuff as well or is it in one particular way or every way it's as many ways as we can i mean the majority of the business especially on the b2c side of things is all telesales so we work with um you know our prime customers have large call centers that's their primary method of uh, response we do have customers that are very successful with additional email and sms follow-up um but really you know building that you know that um closing the loop you know being able to capture interest at that specific point pass it to a call center um qualified you know in real time for them to follow up and then getting that disposition data back in to our system and continue optimizing the campaign like that engine works best with companies that have quite a hungry sales like strategy i think um ultimately it's not going to work for everybody but there probably will be um, nichely generators that potentially could add value. I think I think that's a you know it's a different part of the market that we serve, but really we're looking for those you know fast growing um, you know sales led organisations. Yeah. And I think um, I think you touched upon it slightly, but I kind of want to um, bring it back round because I think people find it interesting. But um, what are the sort of main challenges you face when running BTC lead generator in a global sense? Um, well, the, the one that means me to mind is probably the same challenge that everyone's feeling, which is the, the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, affected people in so many different ways. But um, you know, the way that our business is structured is we're basically a, uh, five or six startups within a large organisation, and we benefit from all the resources of that large, you know, organisation, all the legal, um, tech support, all of that stuff. Um, but also, it means we're quite diversified across different industries. So when the pandemic hit back in March, um, my division, we lost 90% of our revenues overnight. You know, pretty much all of our clients face-to-face -face appointments um, dropped off. You know, we weren't able to serve them leads anymore. Um, luckily, part of our business, you know, is completely online sales generated. So they absolutely boomed during the period, during that period. And now we've recovered all of that revenue. So it's, uh, that, that was obviously a challenge. And I think, you know, also an ongoing challenge with uh, i'm sure you're seeing this with your clients and, and you know your activity of the world has gone even more online all those budgets that were traditionally spent offline are now being poured into digital channels um increasing cpms you know very volatile marketing performance that we weren't necessarily seeing in the same way 
pre the pandemic. So I think that's one challenge, but I guess that's a challenge for everyone. Um, I guess in terms of like being a global lead gen, I'd probably refer back to, you know, what you said about the nuances of each market, you know, that, that comes with it a challenge, you know, to maintain strong relationships with um, clients in all different time zones and markets and, you know, different ways of doing business um, is, is a real challenge. You know, we, we centrally run everything from our UK office, um, but which is great because you get to align on strategy, but you know, it, it, that, that is a challenge and making sure that all the campaigns adhere to the local, you know, compliance issue, which we, we've got a you know, big compliance team that do that, um, but also making sure the language is right and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's one challenge. So what, Jim, when you said just five or six startups, what is that, is that like B2C, B2B, um, what, what do you mean the different verticals? Product ranges. Yeah. yeah okay. So, you know, like, um, there's like home services, business services, business software, um, yeah. and kind of, we develop specialism within each of those product ranges or those demographics. Um, so you kind of get all of the benefits from being a small agile lead generation machine, but you know, you benefit from the scale that MBF has. It's something I've noticed actually, because, um, I think, yeah, we're, we're sort of similar, but obviously in a completely different way because we're doing software, but we are global, but operates, um, we operate from the UK. But something I've noticed is, and this applies globally, is where you get sort of professional lead generators, um, they almost know the market better than anyone else because they, you know, like the verticals that you said, so they, they have to know it um, and know their customer's business so sort of clearly and understand it so well. Um I often refer to those people. So if I want to know something about like I don't know, roofing, I'll sometimes ask a roofing lead generator because they're probably going to know more about it than you know literally anyone else. Yeah, that's a good point. Because they have to investigate I know, I, it. It is strange. You talk to all you know the marketing guys obviously have such an in-depth and that like view on it because they you know it's their bread and butter. But you learn so much about these niches that you never would have previously thought about. Like, I know so much about funeral planning and will writing and the hearing aid market and I can tell you the intricacies of how laser eye surgery works and you know that's what I really love you learn so much about the way that different businesses work not just the product but also you know what drives them the sales engine can buy engine. but that's when you realize that it's kind of in everything mm. um, I think in terms of other challenges you know I've worked on the b2b side of our business as well which you know for a long time was dwarfing what we were doing in B2C, um, you know, largely because of that, you know, comparison style model, you know, we're able to work on a shared, where you sort of monetize the lead multiple times because, you know, SMB buyers are looking for um, a variety of options. Whereas in B2C, it's, it's more an agency style relationship. We were typically working on a one-to-one -one model with, with clients um, and just building on really strong relationships. Um, but that comes with its own challenges. You, know, you don't have to worry about tiering or supply, you know, how many suppliers you're sending it to, like in B2B. But you do have to think about, you know, fatigue, you know, scaling campaigns is, you know, it's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a challenge, even though it's a really positive thing. You know, if you get the right type of client and you can prove ROI really quickly and there's massive amounts of scale, the uh, immediate you know, response or like the, the aim is, you know, let's see how much we can do as quickly as we can do it. And, and through experience, I've learned that can actually cause you the most problems because you get carried away, you know, um, and either the campaign becomes unsustainable, you can't keep up client performance dips because they can't handle the volume. There's, there's so many elements of, you know, what is a great thing that you found and you've managed to, you know, scale rapidly that actually over time we've kind of developed the way to do that really effectively. And I think that in itself is a challenge that all BC leaders have to come on. It's like to almost to pull on, put on the brake slightly and make sure you're doing things in a really sustainable way. You know, fatigue in particular, you know, you could be generating thousands of leads a week. You know, you need to have a constant stream of, you know, creative ideation and, and testing in order to keep up with that. Um, and also changing client, you know, demands often the sort of industries where we do really well you know high growth disruptors um you know in, in that sort of early stage of their of their growth trajectory and then that changes over time so being able to understand that and adapt to it 
I think is really key. It's what I've often thought about lead generators, actually, and, and obviously in larger companies like you guys and smaller ones, that they could pretty much walk into any job um, from a marketing capacity into a company because they understand already, like you were saying, the fatigue, the fact that you need to potentially put the reins on when you're going to do it, where the best traffic, you know, there's so much learning that's sort of taken for granted um, that comes from everything that you guys do and, you know, lead generators do in general. Um, that brands could actually learn a huge amount from it, I think. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would love to have a go at some point in my career on the other side of the fence and, and buy some leads. God, I've uh, experienced all the tactics um, that, that good buyers use as well. And I think if you've, if you've been on both sides, it gives you an insight into the way that um, the system all works. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there's like a... There's a load of stuff that brands can learn from us. And with our big clients, we try and be as transparent as you can in terms of helping them improve their own lead generation efforts. Um, but equally, there's a load of stuff that a third party can do for a client that they don't necessarily need or, or, or want to do. You know, you can, you can test different angles that you maybe wouldn't do with your own brand. Um, you can tap into to channels that it would be impossible for you to develop your own specialism in. You know, MBF is at a size where we can afford to invest in emerging channels and make, you know, significant losses in the, in the aim of learning how they work ahead of everyone else. And I think that's what um, brands need to understand really is that, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to generation is, is pretty hard um, and it seems expensive when you factor in all of the, cost because it's changing so often and um yeah if that makes sense yeah 100 percent. so um one thing we talk about a lot on this show is um quality of leads and you know how we talk about the importance of going for quality over quantity as well um often but i kind of want to ask you from your perspective um how how you ensure the quality um, quality of leads that you're generating especially on like a bigger scale yeah, it's a really good question. I think it's um, something in the time that I've been working in the industry, it's like completely come to the forefront. I think um, even about five years ago, it was not as prevalent or the forefront of when we were running campaigns. And um, I, it's been great to watch the sort of transformation of, of the generation. And, and uh, in fact, listen to people on your podcast who've come on and said that they're, you know, incredibly data driven now and using dis real like quality disposition data to drive their performance decisions and campaign optimizations. Like that's exactly what we should be doing. That, you know, moves the industry forward. Um, we're, you know, huge advocates of very early on in the relationship, setting those expectations. So, you know, key thing for us is to understand, you know, what are we aiming for? What's the outcome of this relationship? You know, if we don't have that up front, it's very hard for us to enter into any long-term or profitable engagement. Um, Dispo data, so as feedback on the lead performance is, is vital. You know, you're not going to get it from every single client um, because of limitations uh, in their sort of tech setup or whatever. But on for all major clients, we we insist on having at least some disposition coverage, um, whether that be how many needs are contacted or booked to an appointment or whatever their target metric is down to, you know, the real detail of, you know, a complete sales funnel. Um, what other things do we, we do? I mean, the, the bit beauty is that it's all in house. So all the marketing we run is generated by MBF employees. So we run all the campaigns ourselves. So we have a really good um, view on, you know, what works and what doesn't. We don't have to, you know, um, have the black box of external providers. Um, we've obviously got a really um, well-developed CRO team. Again, I don't think this is something that necessarily the industry had five years ago, but it's really developing. It's like understanding the value of CRO, not just in increasing conversion rate, but also how do you add intelligent friction into the funnel? Um, so testing alternative qualification methods, longer forms, um, all types of things to try and drive up quality. And obviously when you've got good, good good quality disposition data, you can um, stress test all of those um, techniques and tactics pretty quickly and understand whether they're working. The old, um, the old were, hey, please wait while we get your results. 
Yeah, so that's the old school. That's the old school CRO. I mean, it's stuff like that still works. You know, so some of the best tests, you know, are still the, the simplest ones. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a shift, well, especially you know, after the shifting mindset about, um, you know, less slippery funnels in favor of you know, adding real value as wherever you can, like really transparency and priming customers is, is, is better for everyone, um, especially with the way that the industry is going in terms of, you know, data protection and misleading customers. I think, um, you know, being as transparent as we can, setting expectations, making sure the leads are qualified in real time um, and just, you know, giving a really good customer experience is super important. Um, but Dispo kind of underpins all of that. Um, mm. you know, that's how we ensure the quality. And then it's down to clients really to, to do their side of things, which is the follow up and a really consistent and effective uh, sales process. It's frustrating, isn't it? If you have a client who's going to yeah. spend a quarter of a million pounds with you over the next three months generating leads and they say, oh, we can't get the dispositions back because um, we'd need the tech team and they don't have resource for three months. And you're like, but you're about to spend a quarter of a million pounds. That quarter of a million pounds will go much further if you get the dispositions back than if you don't. I know, it always it fails to like amaze me whenever. Um, or you also find the, um, why do you want it? We don't share that information. It's like, we're just trying to make your job easier so you can make better sales or more sales from the leads we send. The t- uh, it, if you speak to um, Michael on lead generation world, he says it's to do with like an education of lead buyers. So there's, there's a lot, right, that get it, but it's to do with like this information isn't being used against you. It's not being like, I don't know, used in aggregate. It's literally to find the audience that's going to convert so that we can get the CPLs down. You're going to hit more conversions. Um, I've felt it in the past before when you're like, just send the dispositions, like stop thinking about it. I, I don't know we can't explain to you any further than the sort of real transparent way we're saying it. Um, just send the dispositions back, but you still find people that either doubt of the technology or just can't do it. Do they? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's a challenge. And I think that the, as the global side of it is a challenge because I think you in the UK, it's potentially easier to do that. You know, we've even sent tech people down to clients offices to help them literally integrate it. And it's a bit hard to do that when you're talking to someone in, in Indonesia, for example, but, yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. Like, you know, we don't want tech capabilities to hold us back to launching in a market where we think there's big opportunity. Um, I'd love to be able to set up every single client with real time disposition data from day one. But the reality is, you know, we wouldn't have a business if we operated in that way. So yeah. um, we do the best we can. And, you know, whether, you know, at the one end of the scale, you've got someone who's sending, um, even if it's just good and bad leads, you know, as simple as that, like, you know, accepted, not accepted um on a on an ad hoc basis to full funnel disposition data you know that's your gold standard real time through an api you know we want every client to be there but it's you know it's not going to happen overnight and it's interesting watching you know industries that when we entered maybe weren't you know super developed in terms of lead generation and the systems you know implement it takes a long time to put in the right crm software and then you know, build all of the process off the back of that, you have to be quite patient at times. But we found that if you are and you stick with it and you spend a lot of time, you know, you know, working with a client to get to that point and keep keep it at the top of the agenda, you do get there. And then the results speak for themselves. As soon as you we get it, um, we're able to actually make impactful changes. And then they're like, oh, we should have done that a long yeah. time ago. And you're like, yeah, we, <laughs> we've been telling you. So um, it's the... Uh, it will get it will only get better which is the good thing you know it's not going to get worse now it's only going to improve so uh we see you know massive positives in that i think the cro point as well is something that again a lead generator walk, walking into a brand would sort of flip things around quite quickly because um you tend not to see it as much from a brand perspective it's because their eye is just so much on the brand rather than um, yeah, in what way could we either qualify leads better or make it more attractive to people or make this funnel a bit more interesting so that people continue down the path? Um, 
yeah, because you see some like awful landing pages about, and not just like awful looking ones where you just, I mean, actually, it's funny you mention it. I've been arguing with some, not arguing with them, but talking so with someone today about um, a landing page. And it's just, I find really simple things. In this instance, I was just literally looking at it before we started talking, um, where it's got a postcode entry and then find address button, you enter it, and that goes through to a next page. But the postcode entry and the find address button still there with the um, select your address below it i was like it's just distracting to the user you need to like have them laser focused on a single task at a time because otherwise you're just like exactly. you know they don't know what to do anything confusing remove it oh yeah keep it as simple as possible um and i mean you know that's i mean i'm not here to just sell mvf but i think what we do really well is because we've got so much data you know we're, we're operating across so many verse generating so many conversions that okay, not everything is transferable because the markets aren't the same, but landing page tests in particular, if you find something that works or a theme that has a big uplift, you know, it's super easy for us to roll that out across all of our pages and you get that immediate uplift. And I think that's how we're able to stay so competitive in ways because that constant testing is just far quicker than, than if you're a brand yourself or, you know, if you're a, a smaller lead generator. I think it's a critical part of our, our makeup really is just being able to take learnings from stuff that we're doing in American B2B, for example, that might have an impact on what I'm doing over the rest of the world B2C. Just quick, Carl, do you think that the US is ahead of the, say, either the UK or the rest of Europe in every aspect, or is it in certain ones? Good question. Um, I don't, I haven't done enough work in the US to give you like a really accurate answer on that. In terms of the ecosystem, it's far more advanced. Like, the, the scale of, well, obviously the scale of the country, you know, there's, there's some huge lead generators there. Technology wise, there's a lot of um, uh, technology to enable and to like maintain uh, connections between all of the different leaders. I think it just, it's, it's a much more connected um, world over there in terms of lead gen. Um, obviously it's more, a lot more challenging in terms of geography. So um, from a marketing perspective, it's, I think, a lot tougher because it's unlikely that you just run, you know, pretty nation, nationwide campaigns. So um, clearly platforms where your targeting is more limited, for example, on native, it's getting better, um, but it's harder to run campaigns. Whereas in the rest of the world, you can, you can run a lot more effectively. That's one area. Um, I think in, in, in most cases, though, they are, step, they are further ahead than us, um, but we're catching up. I'd say definitely in Europe. Yeah. We, um, we talked there about the importance of getting feedback from the clients um, so you can look at what you're sending them and things like that. But how does it work in terms of how, you know, how involved are you in how they deal with leads that you send it and how they're converting them and things like that? Do you get involved with that side of it? or? Um, oh, big time. I, um, I think that's like a, a big part of it. I, mean, I think... Again, you guys have spoken about it on a on another pod. Was like, you know, the lead is only not even half of the work. I don't think you know the the, the single single biggest like factor in the success is is, is how they how they uh, deal with the leads. And you can have multiple clients in one category who are dealing with the same um, same batch of leads, and they can have vastly different results. We always, I always tell this anecdote. Um, we used to have two different brands on B two B. Um, approved index and expert market and some clients would get sent leads from both brands same sources and they would love one and hate the other sales agents and it was completely like irrational because it was the exact same sources so I think a lot of it is about um, the you know the culture within the sales team it's really important it's about who you've got in there even in even in a, a company that's adept at using you know digital leads there'll be good converters and bad converters. You know, we've got our own call center that now is 100% remote. We deal with thousands of conversions per day, um, qualifying leads and telemarketing leads. Um, so we've got firsthand research and information that we can share with our clients. So as part of any onboarding process, digging into how, how leads are going to be dealt with is a big part of that. You know, who is going to be dealing with them? Can we speak to them? Um, how quickly do you, what's this, what's your sort of metrics for follow up? How many times do you call them? Um, what other touch points do you have with them? What's the script like, you know, what are you saying to these people on the, on the phone calls? Um, 
we we know that that's you know hugely important to our success because if they don't get results then they're not going to keep spending with us so we've got a customer success team who have been working in this industry for a long time and you know decades of experience between them you know working with clients all over the world in different verticals they can then take those best practices and learnings and, and share them um you know whether it's running coaching you know coaching with sales teams running competitions to try and um you know, boost engagement with with leads that we're providing. Um, measuring callback times, we do a lot of mystery shopping, so we'll, we'll submit f- um, fake fake leads um, that don't get billed, and we track how they're um, followed up with, so we can then report back. Um, some clients will give us that in the disposition data, which is super useful. Um, but yeah, that's super important because also what you don't want to do is be optimizing your marketing when actually there's a problem at some point in the in the sales funnel. I think that's the key thing is like disposition data is great if you've got statistically significant amounts of it. So you're not drawing conclusions on small data sets, but also that's not being obscured by, you know, annual leave in the call center or a batch of new starters who are calling the leads and not converting them. So it, you've, you've got to be able to close that loop um, as much as possible. And that relies on having a really strong relationship with the clients, because again, it can be a touchy subject, but the ones who embrace it tend to get really good results. And I think we've got so many case studies. And this is, yeah, again, it's something that's only getting better, you know, where we can show um, how performance has improved and then how budgets then in- increase by us bringing down speed to call a number of dial attempts. Um, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a very easy thing to quantify and show to, to, to clients. Um, especially, you know, we work with quite a few global groups and, you know, you do it in one market and then they all want a piece of it. So it, it's been highly effective for us and something we invest constantly in. I remember seeing in the past saying to a client about um, dispositions, we send dispositions back and they couldn't do it. I said, okay, can you send back stats per sales agent? So let's say they had 20 and highest performing or the, there were like four of them that were better you know were three times better than the others i was like well what like what's the difference and they was like oh they're just yeah. really good at sales so it was like you're saying it was like well imagine they were all like that then you you know the, the conversion rates would be entirely different so your average of seven yeah. percent could actually be 15 percent. it's just turn the whole thing on its head um and again, it comes back to this thing, it's impossible to recognize or do anything about it without dispositions, without knowing what the outcomes are of the leads, um, with as much information around it as possible, the age and the time, everything. Yeah. I mean, we live in a world where you can basically track absolutely everything. Um, so you should measure all of that stuff and track it where you can. One thing you can't measure really, and I'm sure we'll get to the point where we'll have, you know, we trial this, like AI, um that can understand recordings of people's calls to then influence you know what's what works and what doesn't work like that's where we'll get to at the moment that's the thing that's still you know it's not qualitative that's, it's not quantitative that's qualitative and you need to have really effective coaches to be able to bring out the best of people that's the hardest thing for us to like control, sublim- subliminal keywords so if you just suddenly drop yeah. crocodile in they'll convert <laughs> yeah who knows um but yeah i think i think it's um i think it's not a, it's not a um it's not a secret that, yeah. that speed to call is the single biggest factor um you know the, the quicker you can get it, it seems counterintuitive for some people um you know they think it's you know weirds people out but honestly it's um it has such a big impact past sort of five minutes you the drop off just is exponential yeah 100 percent. i've actually had people argue with me about though oh you know it's not always like that but they um it's to do with the type of lead so um, I think there's two different ones. So one is the type of the opt-in. So if you're doing something like this co-sponsor where it's a different type of lead that's being shared off the back of it, you might have like 20 companies all trying to contact someone at the same time. And there's a potential advantage by waiting until they've got like annoyed and then doing it later. Or the other is um, like an email sign up where you might, you know, you could send one, but then it's more of a nurturing funnel. But where it's like, you know, there's reasonable intent there and they've left a telephone number. The reality is they're probably expecting to be contacted fairly quickly. And so that's, you know, it makes sense why they, you get the conversions. Yeah. There. I mean, you know, for, from, from our, you know, we only do 
real time one to one lead generation. So when you get when a client is sent a contact, that person has literally just filled in that form and has been sent to you. Mm -hmm. And on you know it, it obviously varies in demographic, but the majority of those people are doing it on their mobile. So they're they're probably holding it in their hand when you call. And actually, that's kind of a moment of you know customer service delight. You know, I think people it actually goes down pretty well in, in most in most cases um, yeah maybe it's different like you said on some of those other campaigns where it's maybe not quite as intent driven um but you know i always say let's look at the numbers you know and i would say the numbers we probably much always uh, sort of direct towards speed as best mm. josh i kind of want to bring this back around to the, the title of the part um to, kind of, to sort of round it up, I suppose. Um, and I want to do that with a hypothetical. Let's um, let's say a CMO of a big brand that's listening to this pod and obviously has some interest in lead generation, but maybe doesn't do it yet, but it kind of wants to get into doing lead yeah. gen. Um, what would you say to them listening uh, as to why they should actually do lead gen? Uh, I think I'll say, you know, what we talked about at the beginning of the pod is like, they probably are already doing lead generation in some format. I'd be very surprised if any big brand wasn't. Um, it might be they're not doing the sort of third party buying of, of leads, um, whether that's because they've been screwed over before or they've got a bias towards branded campaigns. But um, I guess if they're, if they're in a vertical that we already run, you know, I find the best way to entice someone is to say, well, you know, we're generating thousands of potential customers for your product every single month. And they're currently going to your competitors and they're closing them at X rate um, and they're increasing their orders. So, you know, do you, want to, do you want to get involved in that? And that tends to work pretty well. Um, but ultimately, I think it comes down to like understanding a, like a client. You know, not everyone is suited for it. They've got different growth, different ambitions. But if someone is you know, hungry for growth, the unit economics stack up. So they've got a reasonable cost of surgery, a cost of sale target, you know, they're looking to acquire customers for ten pounds. It's not going to work, but if they can um, afford to spend up to sort of a thousand pounds on on a, acquiring a new customer, then I'm pretty sure lead generation would work for them. Um, and as like I said before, you know, it, lead generation is hard. Um, it requires loads of investment to stay on top of, you know, what platforms are delivering value. You know, hiring and retaining you know, top marketing talent. Um, you know, there's loads of hidden costs that I don't think a lot of CMOs truly like apply to their own internal marketing. So like the cost of that hiring and training and maintaining those people, the compliance cost to make sure that, you know, with, you know it's changing month on month you know, to make sure you're doing everything as you should as a data collector. Um, and yet yeah, investing in new channels, because ultimately, you know, our, our CRO, Dan Tobin, has this great sort of saying about what we do which is you know in the future we'll be generating leads for products that don't exist yet on channels that don't exist yet and i think that's like our kind of mantra is like we're constantly looking for new niches we can exploit you know we're vertical agnostic we can go after anything um as long as the sort of unit as i said the unit economics stack up um and we'll test anything you know that's got audience um and i think it's really really hard for a, for a brand to do that themselves so why not focus on, you know, your product, your sales process, and let us worry about getting the customers? Yeah, hundred percent. One other question I had, um, uh, it's just related to the time thing. What what is so good about MVF in terms of, like you said, you've been top in the Sunday Times in the top three for six, seven years. I've seen it. It's you know, it's really well known. What would you say is the sort of key to that? I think we hire really like like really um, really well to values. So um, it's just a really fun place to be. Like I think the founders, you know, in, in what is traditionally maybe not such an exciting industry, have really tried to make the company as um, as exciting and fun to work for. You know, obviously not so much during during the pandemic, but you know the office culture is really really strong. Um, it does feel like you have, you know, really close friends at work rather than just coming in and working with colleagues. Um, but also, I think they, we invest a lot in development. So people come in, you know, really bright grads can come in. They learn from industry leaders in whatever function that they come in at. Um, and, and they've really given a lot of 
um, responsibility early on and an opportunity to develop. And I think, you know, whether you stay at MVF for a long time, like I have, and a lot of other people have, um, or move on and, and, you know, it's a really good springboard to another career within digital marketing. Loads of people leave us and become head of marketing or, you know, um, head of growth at other startups. So I think it, it just gives you a really good grounding in digital marketing, but also it's a fast moving, exciting place to work. Well, I think um, people listening to that will have one of two reactions. They might, you know, learn loads to get on with their own lead generation or buying leads or whatever, or they may be applying to a, to a job with you guys, if not after that. After that pitch, it was uh, well, sound know, good. Um, sound good. I'll get a referral code. So, uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today, Josh. Um, yeah, it's been really good. And yeah, I think we spoke about it before. Maybe maybe just start this. I can't remember, but we might need a part two, I think, to uh, go into some more depth and we'll uh, analyze something else in the future. But yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's been great. Absolutely. Yeah. Cheers, chaps. Cheers, Josh. Thanks for listening to the B2C Lead Generation Podcast, the show for serious lead generators. Be sure to hit subscribe to hear more from those at the very cutting edge of the lead gen world.